Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm your host, Andy. And I'm your co-host, Adam. This week, there was a bit of news for Microsoft Defender Identity, formerly known as Azure ATP, and they expanded and added some ADFS support. And we've talked about Microsoft Defender for Identity before on the show, but Adam, if you could just give our listeners a quick rundown of what it does and how it protects your environment. Yeah. So if you remember, this product used to be called Azure ATP, which was honestly a pretty terrible name, even in the history of bad names for Microsoft, because it is completely focused on your on-premises identities. And so I think the name change to Microsoft Defender for Identity is actually, in the annals of Microsoft name changes, one of the better ones. What this product does, you install an agent on your domain controllers that looks for traffic coming to and from those domain controllers, like authentication traffic traffic, enumeration traffic, that sort of thing, and then sends it all to a cloud service that does all of the storage and processing to generate alerts. And the alerts are going to be really in one of three main categories. So first off, behavioral alerts. Andy signed into a computer we've never seen him use before. Andy signed it in a time we've never seen him use before. Andy added himself to the domain admins group, things like that. The second category of alerts are going to be things like reconnaissance efforts, enumerating LDAP queries from the domain controller, attempting to do encryption downgrades when you connect to file servers, that sort of thing. And then the final one is going to be evidence of lateral movement, past the hash, past the ticket, golden ticket, those kind of things. So Microsoft Defender for Identity, super valuable for detecting anomalous behavior on premises. So what's been added is now the ability to cover ADFS as well. So ADFS environments are federated environments that help extend your on-premises identity to other applications. And they They often sit where they are publicly accessible from the internet. So of course, they're under constant attack and have really come to light with even more attacks in the aftermath of the SolarWinds compromise. So there's now an agent you can install on your ADFS servers that will help add even more telemetry and alerting to Microsoft Defender for Identity. And so that's just something you should definitely install and use if you have access to Microsoft Defender for Identity and if you still have an ADFS environment that's operational, highly, highly, highly recommend you do this just because it's going to help alert you to some of those anomalous behaviors. Great. That's a new feature that was just released. And if you already have Microsoft Defender for Identity, it's nice because you can correlate the data between the new sensor on the ADFS servers and your sensors on your domain controllers. Exactly. So some other interesting news that I saw this week that I just wanted to chat with you about, Adam, and see what your thoughts are. I saw at CES 2021, uh, there was some news about Intel releasing silicon-level ransomware protection on their new chips. And so I read about how this works, and what it basically does is it uses two Intel features, one called Hardware Shield, which is used to lock down the UEFI and BIOS, and then another one called Intel Threat Detection technology, which uses CPU telemetry to detect possible malicious code. And both of these work on the CPU directly, many layers below like the software and where most AV endpoint protection solutions are. And so the idea would be that it shares data and telemetry from the CPU level to the software level and that it can preemptively notify your endpoint protection of possible malicious activity at the CPU level. There's a open partnership with a endpoint protection company called Cyber Reason. And from what I gather, there's nothing that you need to do to enable the protection. If you're using Cyber Reason and you have these new Intel chips, the protection will automatically be enabled. So I thought that was pretty cool. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that, Adam. You know, a lot has been made of the demise of Intel over the past couple of weeks, ever since Apple released their new M1 CPUs. And I think that's a little overblown. Intel, of course, has an incredible footprint in the enterprise where so many line of business apps are compiled to run on Intel and are pretty unlikely to be compiled for any other CPU architecture anytime soon. So I think we still need to consider Intel's contributions to this space are interesting and 
will help moving forward. Obviously, you got to start somewhere. They found one vendor to partner with, Cyber Reason. You know, not a big name, but but one I've heard of before for sure. And of course, anytime you can do security at a hardware level, it sits below that software level and, and can add additional layers of capability. And so I think too, you know, Microsoft had an announcement recently about their Pluton security processor, and they were partnering with AMD, Intel, and Qualcomm on that to build in more of a, a stronger secure enclave with those existing CPUs, kind of borrowing technology that was learned from Xbox. And that's interesting as well. So we, we've definitely continued to have hardware-based security announcements that bring value and add new capabilities. So I'm all for it. I think this is great. I'd be curious to know if they're going to license this to AMD or if this is going to be something that's exclusive to Intel, especially with AMD starting to build a performance gap in several different workloads. I think that's an interesting conversation too that I'd like to hear more about. Yeah, I'm certainly hoping that they partner with some other endpoint protection solutions. It would be very interesting and beneficial because ransomware is certainly a huge attack footprint right now. So onto our main topic for this week's episode, there's been a lot of chatter and news about the new privacy policy change with WhatsApp. And privacy is kind of this thing where a lot of times it overlaps with security, but privacy and security are kind of two different things. I like to think of it like a Venn diagram, right? There's things that are specifically security and there's things that are specifically privacy, and then they do overlap in some sense. A lot of times when I sit in those compliance conferences, you'll see a mix of lawyers, people who focus on compliance, and then some security people. It's definitely a mix of people. Whereas if you sit in like an endpoint, protection conference session, it's all security people, right? A lot of people look to secure messaging apps mainly because of privacy. Obviously, we want them to be secure too. The protocol that transports the message and stores the messages, we want those to be secure. But most people look to secure messaging apps because they want their messages to stay private. And so that's why when WhatsApp and their parent company, Facebook, released this news and this new privacy policy saying that WhatsApp is going to force users to share their data with Facebook or delete the app or stop using the app completely, there was a huge uproar. And to be fair, this was basically unveiling the privacy practices that WhatsApp has been doing all along. Users weren't aware that in 2016, when WhatsApp was acquired by Facebook, they gave users a one-time chance to opt out of sharing their data with Facebook. And if you didn't opt out, you essentially, you've been doing this the whole time. This just says, hey, we're forcing you to do it. Also, the original date was February 8th when the enforcement was going to happen. I just saw on the news this afternoon that WhatsApp is pushing that back three months to May 15th to try to clear up the confusion about the new privacy policy. You know, if you asked me a couple of years ago, I think my response would have been more of a, why is this a big deal sort of thing? Because WhatsApp still does not have the ability to read the content of your messages. So the part you care most about is still end-to-end -end encrypted and is not viewable by Facebook. So that's a good thing. And that is not changing. So the fundamental privacy of the main product is intact. However, one thing we have learned more and more and more as we have gone through this digital transformation with these computers in our pockets is to what lengths these companies, these mass surveillance companies will go to to build a dossier on you and all of your information. So remember two iOS versions ago, Apple made applications have to request permission to use the Bluetooth radio. And it was astounding the applications that use your Bluetooth radio that have no business using it. You fire up the ESPN app because you want to check the score of a major league baseball game and it says hey i want to i want to use bluetooth what on earth for what what are we talking about here and there'd be other absurd examples as well well what they were doing was turning on the bluetooth radio because they could do it silently and then scanning for any bluetooth mac addresses in the area to attempt to determine where you were without using location services and so you think of all this little metadata and you're like yeah what's the big deal they're never going to be able to correlate that oh yes they are you know that's their bread and butter they can take seemingly the most 
innocuous data and still use it to correlate back to your profile? Why do you think now iOS devices, their default behavior is they will randomize your MAC address every time they connect to a Wi-Fi network? Same thing, doing MAC address tracking and all sorts of creepy stuff. So, you know, it's important not to oversell this, but it's important not to undersell it either. Right, Andy? Where there's there's things to be concerned about and, and we have valid concerns, especially coming from a company like Facebook that is practically the downfall of the democratic society at this point. <laughs> not to be hyperbolic or anything, but they don't they don't deserve the benefit of the doubt, right? And so I think that's where a lot of this uproar is coming from. Yeah. I mean, all that metadata, I think, as you said, in the years that have followed, we have become acutely aware that all this data is being monetized and they will try to mine every single piece of it to try to monetize it. And Facebook and WhatsApp have kind of gone to social media to try to clear this up because they're saying, you know, we're not able to read your messages. It's still private. This is the privacy policy. But, you know, people are obviously skeptical because it's Facebook, right? I mean, they pretty much lost all credibility when it comes to privacy. And then most importantly, for EU citizens, because of GDPR, you know, they're exempt from this new privacy policy as expected. Facebook has different operating procedures when it comes to the EU. I did read, though, which is goes to speak again to how Facebook just rushes in there and tries to monetize it because of Brexit. UK citizens are no longer under GDPR. So as soon as Brexit happened, Facebook changed their operating procedures for UK citizens. So now UK citizens are free game when it comes to Facebook and their data mining. When I think of regulation, generally speaking, if there is a regulation that's stronger than every other regulation, most companies would just say, we're going to comply with the stronger regulation everywhere, so we don't have to deal with having two sets of policy. It's just easier, right? So why not just honor GDPR everywhere? You're going to be in compliance with almost any other privacy regulation just by doing that. Of course, LOL, not Facebook. They're not going to do that. So moving on, due to a tweet from Elon Musk, millions of people are leaving WhatsApp and they're migrating to Signal because Elon tweet basically said, use Signal. And so Signal saw a 42,000% jump in user registrations last week. There were delays in user registrations. Signal requires a phone number, a text message, and the telecom companies were actually having a hard time keeping up with how many texts were coming through. And so there was a delay in user new user registrations registration. Then this week, specifically today, Friday, we're recording on, Signal has been down almost all day because they've been furiously working to add new servers to try to provide more capacity and scaling for all the people that are coming on board. And to be fair, there is no service, no company in the world that can onboard 40 million people, which is what Signal has done in one week globally. I mean, that's a monumental task. So it's expected, you know, kind of like what happened to Zoom during the pandemic, right? Everyone went to Zoom and, and they had problems. It's just unexpected scaling. They're going to bounce back. So I, I have faith that they will you know, weather the storm and come out and be scalable. Adam and I, we want to kind of just break down the different secure apps that are there, the pros and cons of each one, and kind of like our recommendation going forward. So just starting with Signal, since we're on that one, it is end-to-end -end encrypted, which means that the messages are stored only on your device, not on any other servers. They use a Signal protocol, which was developed developed by Moxie and, and some other folks who started the company. It's open source. It's been reviewed cryptographically and it's passed multiple audits. Most notably, it's used by Edward Snowden. He uses it to discuss things and he's still alive. That was his tweet earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> I use Signal and I'm still alive, so good enough for me. It's independent, nonprofit, with a fifty million dollar endowment, which means that they can't be meaningfully bought for you know an extended period of time. They're mostly funded by donations and grants. They do require a phone number and they do store that. It, it's mandatory, but they do make zero attempt to try to link that to your identity. But as most privacy advocates note, your phone number is most of the time it's not private. It's available through open source intelligence. You can probably find what my phone number is if you did a lot of digging. So, you know, arguably that you can attribute that to an identity, right? There's also a lot of talk from privacy advocates about one of Signal's features that they really dislike, which is, and if you've been using it this week, you've probably seen it. When your friend joins Signal and you have them in your contact book, it gives you a notification that is on by default. And what I can't do is turn off that for when I join Signal. So if I have Adam in my contacts, and he joins Signal, I get a notification that Adam joins. I can turn that off so that 
any one of my contacts joins, I won't get notified. But what Adam can't do is join Signal and say, by default, I don't want Andy to know I joined Signal, right? And so that's a huge privacy issue because if you're in an abusive relationship, which is one of the reasons why you may want to use a secure chat to try to communicate with people outside of that relationship, if your abuser has your phone number in their contacts and you join Signal and they happen to be on Signal, they're going to get notified that you joined. And then, of course, that can be problematic. So that's one of the main reasons why privacy advocates are not embracing Signal. But from a security standpoint, it's certainly very sound. Signal is also a U.S. IT service provider, which means that it's subject to the Cloud Act, which just entitles U.S authorities to access the service provider's data. This has happened in a few subpoenas, but understand that the messages aren't stored on the servers. They're only stored in transit and they have very, very limited data on attributing data to a specific person. So if they have your phone number, they can subpoena the phone number and any records of it. And if it's registered with Signal, obviously Signal is going to have that as history, but they can only say when that user joined Signal and when was the last time that that user connected to the service. And that's pretty much it. I think Signal is a, a really good blend of usability and security because while it is highly secure, it's not terribly difficult to get started. It's not something only for neckbeards or something. You know, average Joes can use Signal without a problem. It's easy to stand up and get started. There are some weird quirks with how it works, which might seem weird to somebody who has never used something like that before or might not understand the architecture of it. For example, if you want to sign in on a PC or a Macintosh with the Signal client on those platforms, you have to scan a QR code from your phone or something like that. And it's like linked back to your phone in terms of how you do that join. So it kind of feels odd, but there's, again, all the architectural things we already discussed are kind of the reason why it behaves that way. So I think a really good blend of usability and security and privacy. Yeah. And then of course there's WhatsApp, which we've talked about end-to-end -end encrypted, and it actually uses the Signal protocol that Signal uses on the back end for its encryption. Of course, they've implemented it in a little bit of a different way. Because WhatsApp is owned by Facebook, they allow some metadata to be available outside of that Signal protocol. So the end-to-end -end encryption is there, but the metadata that gets tracked within the app it gets funneled to Facebook. And of course, Facebook is financed by targeted advertisement, which requires detailed user information, WhatsApp will store your phone number, your email address, contacts. If you use WhatsApp for any type of product interaction, recently I actually was using WhatsApp for support with Dell PCs. They have a direct link to WhatsApp for their support. So you can use WhatsApp to do that. And that would be shared with Facebook as well. Any purchase history. So all of that, anything that you do within there that has any type of metadata is then shared with Facebook and monetized. And of course, they're headquartered in the US, so also subject to the Cloud Act. But they really shouldn't be used for any type of sensitive conversations. Not to say that, you know, your conversation is going to be spied on, but the metadata is, is certainly valuable and can attribute a lot of things to you as an identity. So then in the third one that we wanted to kind of talk about is Telegram. Telegram has often been touted in the security community among a lot of folks or in the privacy community as a secure messaging app, but it is a standard private company. So it has to at least have some sort of business model. They are funded through donations. They have released some press releases that indicate that they want to eventually use advertisements to fund their messaging app, but it's different. It's not like going to be like Facebook or WhatsApp where there's micro targeted ads. So they're not collecting user data like WhatsApp and Facebook are. They're popular because they're among the first to really offer any type of end-to-end -end encryption. They were before before WhatsApp became end-to-end -end encrypted, they were before Signal. But the way that they're designed is fundamentally different than the new messaging apps. Telegram, by default, it's a cloud solution, and it uses, by default, the server client encryption model. You can get a client-to-client -client encryption, or otherwise known as end-to-end -end encryption, but by default, everything is server to client encrypted. So that means that your data, messages, photos, videos that you send through Telegram are stored on Telegram's servers. 
Unlike Signal, where you pass through the, the servers while your message is in transit and then deleted after the message is delivered, Telegram stores the stuff on their servers, which is convenient because Telegram has a way to sync to different devices and have all that stuff download, right? But it is certainly not end-to-end -end encrypted, and they have the keys, I believe, and would be able to provide the de-encrypted messages to law enforcement if required. Yeah, I, I looked this up when we were doing kind of our pre-show and, and discussing this, Andy, and Telegram states that they store their keys in different data centers than the data is stored in. That's to protect against if there was a physical attack to that local data center and you stole that data, the keys wouldn't be in that data center. It's it's almost like Toad saying our princess is in another castle. It's instead, hey, you raided our data center, congratulations, but the keys are in another data center. So there is some benefit to that. But like you said, since the keys are at the end of the day under the organizational control of Telegram, and Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't Telegram, are are they based in the Netherlands? Is that right? Yep. They're not a U.S. company. They're not a U.S. company. So, you know, you get into gray area of international law there. But theoretically, if they were to receive a subpoena and they decided to comply with it, they would have the technical means to obtain those decryption keys, bring them to another data center and decrypt the data in theory. They say that, of course, their engineers would not have standing access to do that. But, you know, if we're talking in the realm of possibility. So, you know, conceptually, server client encryption, that that's in the same realm is, you know, Facebook Messenger, your messages are encrypted between your device and the Facebook service, or even like a thing like Microsoft Teams. But I think the fundamental difference is they're saying their key management is kind of your protective barrier here that's going to be better than potentially some of those other services. And so that's interesting to think about. But again, it's not really in the same class as everything else we've discussed. Yeah, most people like the client to client encryption because you know that it only is available on your device and then the device that you sent it to, right? It's not available anywhere else that anyone can get to. So being touted as a privacy app, probably not in the same realm. Security app, sure. I mean, it can be argued that their encryption protocol is probably fairly sound, which they actually use a custom protocol called MT Proto and it was developed by them and it's been reviewed. It's probably cryptographically sound. And secure, but privacy wise, because the messages are available on servers and they own the keys to it, regardless of whether they're stored together or whether or not they, by policy, aren't going to read your messages, still you know, less private. From a usability perspective, though, it is going to behave more like how we're accustomed to apps working. Anywhere you can download a Telegram client, you can sign in with your credentials and you will see the same messages across all devices. Of course, that's the benefit of their architecture, but then we've also discussed the drawbacks as well. So that might be why people say, well, I don't like Signal because I set it up on a new device and my chat history is gone. Again, that's by design, right? And so Telegram's what looks like a better user experience and it is, has those privacy drawbacks. Signal does have a way built in to transfer messages, but you have to have your previous device <laughs> because they're they're stored on the device. So if you if you lose that device, then yes, you, your message history is gone. But mm -hmm. let's say I'm I get a new phone, I still have my old phone. Mm -hmm. You can scan the QR code, then transfer the history over. Mm -hmm. Which is a totally normal user usability thing that my mother does all the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> Most users probably, you know, they get rid of their phone and then they get a new one, right? They don't even think about all the other things. That too, good point. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Most people don't possess both of their phones at the same time for very long. Correct. So then the last one we're going to kind of dive into details is called Threema. And this is a company that is headquartered in Switzerland. They're extremely privacy conscious. And the app was built with privacy and security in mind, specifically privacy first. It's end-to-end -end encrypted and it uses an open source cryptography library called NACL. And since it's headquartered in Switzerland, it's not subject to US federal laws. Threema doesn't store any personal information. It doesn't require a phone number. It doesn't require any emails to stand up an account. Content sync is available, but it only sync it locally to your app, not to their servers. And so if you need to invite people to Threema, you have to do it through like a personal invite code. Or if I'm in person, you can do like a QR code scan. The servers work very similar to Signal where the messages will pass through in transit, but then as soon as they're delivered, they're deleted from the servers. 
They just went open source. They've had a few researchers audit it with some minor issues that have been resolved after the audits. Their business model is that they're funded through an app purchase. So that's kind of one of the barriers, I think, to this particular messaging app is that if I tell you, Adam, to switch to Threema and I say, go download Threema because I'm on Threema, you're going to go to the app store and you're going to see that it costs money to actually get the app. It's not a lot of money. It's on the app store for $2.99, but you're going to be like, well, I don't know if I want to pay three bucks for this, right? Well, in my case, I'm kind of an outlier because I I happily pay for good software on my smartphones all the time. But we all know that for whatever reason, people have a real aversion for paying for software. And that's another discussion for another time, but absolutely would be a barrier for entry because I know a lot of people who, you know, will spend that money and much more at Starbucks every single day. But getting them to pay an app that can protect their privacy for years to come is like pulling teeth. And that's too bad. But totally agree that's going to be a uh, a headwind towards adoption for sure when I was researching this app, which I've heard of before, I haven't used it personally, but when I was just doing some research for the show, I found that Threema actually has an enterprise option. And I'm not exactly sure how that works if your chat messages are still end-to-end -end encrypted, but there's an organizational key that might be able to decrypt them all. But it brought up an interesting question that I was following on Twitter this week. Someone had asked, you know, as part of the insurrection last week, if employers should go back and check their employees, you know, slash messages and Teams messages to see if they're using organizational tools to essentially organize this insurrection or communicate as part of it. More of an ethical question if, if employers should do this, but you know, in my opinion, anything that's done on company software is pretty much open season, right? Like you should assume that all your chats and emails and everything and anything you do on your computer is monitored and recorded and can be, you know, discovered by your employer at any time. Yeah, totally agree. And and it's even take it to another level, Andy, not only would it be on your company issued device, but it'd be on a service that is specifically designed to facilitate company business. And so I think you've got the double dose there of reason why that is fair game. And I'll even add something else that might be interesting to be aware of. Microsoft has been building tools, mostly from a, a compliance focus there called communications compliance that's baked into all of the different Office 365 services. And maybe there's another name for it as well. I don't know off the top of my head, but it is some machine learning algorithms that you can use to scan the communications that go on inside of Microsoft Teams, for example, and look for things like targeted harassment, offensive language, or threats of violence is one of the things it can specifically find and pull out for you. So not only can your company go run manual queries to look for these things, but Microsoft is building technologies to automatically using machine learning flag conversations that are inappropriate, whether they're harassment or offensive language or threats, among others, and pull them out and present them to compliance or HR for further review. So it's not only something like, should companies do it or not, but they are, and they're asking companies like Microsoft to help make that possible, help facilitate it. So we have a runner up that we wanted to just discuss real quick too, because when it comes to secure messaging, iMessage always comes up as, you know, iMessage is secure, it's end to end encrypted, Apple is privacy focused, and they're about security. So, you know, iMessage is end to end encrypted. You know, obviously a limitation when it comes to chat apps is you want to be able to communicate with everyone on any type of hardware or device. And obviously iMessage is limited to Apple hardware. Mm -hmm. One big privacy issue when it comes to iMessage is that if you use iCloud to back up your iMessages, your iCloud backups are not end to end encrypted or to be more exact, the encryption key for your iMessage message is backed up with that iCloud. So Apple could provide that iCloud backup with the history of your iMessages under a legal subpoena to federal law enforcement or any type of law enforcement. And this is something that is really interesting because Apple has a bit of documentation that lays out when you do an iCloud backup, 
how are different things encrypted or stored. And so there's certain things that are just stored data at rest encryption, which of course Apple possesses the keys and can provide at any time when a subpoena is issued. Then there are things Apple calls out are end-to-end -end encrypted, and they are entangled with a key that is generated using a unique identifier from your device plus your device pin to encrypt them. So those bits of information could not be provided to law enforcement with a valid subpoena. Apple doesn't have a way of gaining access to them. And so you have those kind of two callouts. And then they have a third kind of separate callout specific for messages in the cloud, which is that iMessage sync technology between all your devices, where it is theoretically end-to-end -end encrypted, but for convenience, Apple includes that decryption key in your iCloud backup, which again can be subpoenaed by law enforcement. So they can get the key, they can get all your messages, they can decrypt all your messages. Hooray. If you kind of followed this whole story back to remember the San Bernardino case, which was probably the largest example where the FBI really went after Apple to create back doors in the iOS operating system. And they wanted a way to break into that shooter's device. So they wanted Apple to create, you know, a FBI OS essentially and build a back door into it and then flash it to the iPhone. So then the FBI could get in and look around and Apple refused. And I think what you're seeing here, and obviously nobody has any reason to back this up, is potentially some sort of compromise where Apple has chosen not to do messages in such a way so that they can be produced with a valid subpoena by law enforcement. And that's kind of a compromise to prevent them from having to backdoor their operating system. Now, you could also argue if you've spent any time in an Apple store and you've sat waiting for somebody at the Genius Bar, you've heard stories of data loss around you left and right. It's heartbreaking. Half of being a genius is telling people they lost their data, they lost their photos, they lost whatever. Apple could do a thing, you know, they're technically capable of building something with really strong end-to-end -end encryption where if you lose this, then you can't get it back forever. So sad, sorry. Given Apple's kind of market position and Apple's public persona, is that in their best interest? Or maybe they're better off having a way for that to be recoverable because it's better for user satisfaction. So maybe it's not an FBI thing at all. Maybe it's Apple has really chosen to design it that way on purpose because of where they sit in the industry, because of how pervasive their devices are. And they're trying to create a balance of security and privacy and usability. And that's where they've chosen to come out. We don't know because they haven't told us, but it's interesting to think about where that lies in. So, you know, if you want to make iMessage completely secure, turn off all cloud ba iCloud backup entirely. Now you have end-to-end -end encryption on iMessage and then take all your encrypted backups locally using iTunes, which is still an option, believe it or not. And now you do have a perfectly secure end-to-end -end encrypted messaging platform. But to be honest, that's kind of bananas and nobody does that, right? Nobody's plugging their iPhone into their Mac or PC to back it up all the time. They love the simplicity of if you have an iPhone and you put it on to charge at night, it backs everything up. So if you drop it in a toilet, throw it out of a moving car, it just fails to boot, you can recover your backup easily. So like so many things, it's that balance of real life needs versus your privacy needs. And there's an intersection here that they've designed the product that certain way. And there's a number of reasons we could speculate as to why, but it is the way it is. And, and as Andy is, is right to point out, despite the end-to-end -end encryption of iMessage because of the backup issues, you should not plan on your iMessages being impossible for somebody else to read ever because there is a technical path to get there. You know what's interesting, Andy? You talked at the top of the show about the Venn diagram of security versus privacy. And I think I have a really good way to kind of articulate that. Anything you do on Facebook is obviously not private, right? I think we would agree with that really easily. However, think of both Facebook and Google as, again, these companies that have pervasive surveillance programs and that's designed to feed their advertising engines. However, nobody would say with a straight face, that Google's bad at security. Google, as far as I know, has never really had a major breach of any kind. I mean, there's a couple of things like with some deprecated apps that they were already going to shut down anyways, like Google Plus had an issue, right? But overall, like Google's pretty darn good at security. And Facebook is actually pretty darn good at security, right? That data is so valuable to them. They don't want anybody else to get to it. They don't want anybody else to get to their crown jewels. So they're really protective of it. They're going to mine the heck out of it for their own purposes, but they're not going to let anybody else see it. And so I think that kind of really lays out the difference between security and privacy, right?
Exactly. That's a great example. So we went over all of these different apps, but I do want to put in there as a caveat because this was brought to my attention and it was honestly something that I didn't think about until I read about it and it totally made sense. But every single one of these end-to-end -end encryption messaging apps has an exploit that is very easily implemented and it comes down to third-party keyboards. You know, third-party keyboards, they obviously are convenient because they can learn the way that you type and the, the words that you use in sequence and kind of make it faster for you. But they sync to cloud services and they log passwords, PII, PHI, you know, all sorts of things that you really don't want to have stored in a cloud solution. And even Gboard, you know, arguably that's uh, for Android at least, you know, that's synced to Google services and you're trusting Google not to mine that data. This really just came to a my attention because there's someone that I follow on Twitter that is basically commenting about how Western journalists are recommending Signal to be used for their at-risk sources in China, where there's a legitimate fear that if your messages against the government are discovered, you're going to get imprisoned. And it's actually happened because of third-party keyboards. And so, you know, one, I think a lot of these companies should kind of put out more awareness that this this is an exploit and really you shouldn't use third party keyboards when it comes to secure messaging if you truly want privacy. And of course, we're just going to tell you don't use third party keyboards. Yeah, and it's something that we know there is a technical means to do because Microsoft Intune is part of its mobile application management capabilities, which don't require any sort of like MDM or, or device level management at all, have implemented the capability to prohibit the use of third-party keyboards with apps that are enabled for that technology. So it's definitely possible Microsoft has proved it. We would love to see other companies, again, like Signal should at least throw up an, a message that says, hey, we noticed you're using a third-party keyboard. You might not want to do that because of reasons X, Y, and Z. That would be a very reasonable thing for them to do. Understanding the use case that most people are downloading their app to use in the first place, that would just be a reasonable notification. So we're giving you one here on this podcast, but of course we can't reach the entire audience of Signal and it would be a good idea for them to add that to the app. So to wrap things up, if you absolutely need privacy, you know, I think we would recommend Threema as your messaging app, but understand that there's a barrier to entry because there's a cost. So I think it's probably more of a niche choice for folks that absolutely need privacy as their number one focus because it doesn't require a phone number. It doesn't have any type of notification that so-and-so has joined Signal. That'll probably be our recommendation. However, for the majority of people in the world, Signal's probably going to be the best choice over Overall, mainly because right now there's 60 million people now who are on Signal <laughs> due to the whole WhatsApp thing. And, you know, the best messaging app is the ones that you can talk to your friends on. And if you're not on the messaging app, then what's the point? <laughs> you're just going to be messaging yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So that pretty much wraps things up. That's our show for this week. If you have a security topic you want us to talk about, or if you have some follow-up questions about this show, our contact information will be in the show notes. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.